First guests are quite familiar with the facts and figures that were laid out in the governor's budget proposal. They have been poring over these numbers for weeks now. Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy and State Budget Director Bob Megna are joining us this evening from inside the Red Room at the State Capitol. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time tonight. Liz, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I know you are tired. <laughs> it has been a very long um, slog towards this moment, and the news, of course, was not great. Um, I'd like to start with you, uh, Mr. Magna, if you don't mind. Could you just speak a little bit more about this quote-unquote sham process that the governor uncovered that sort of had built-in budget deficits, if you will, or built-in increases that led to deficits? When were these uncovered, and, and why did he choose to reveal them 24 hours before this presentation? Well, I think the governor, again, as I said today, I think he, as soon as he came into office, we started having budget briefings. And as he went through the numbers, I think, you know, he focused on getting to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, as he saw it, was that we have, and as we showed him the numbers, that, you know, we had very large, what people call base growth, which is what current law requires us to spend money on. Mm. And that those increases were you know, up to 12%. In the Medicaid case, it was 13%. In the school aid case, it was 13%. When you put it all together, base growth in the overall budget was 12%. And he said, you know, beyond the numbers, that's just unsustainable. It's not good fiscal practice. And, you know, we have to stop talking about the numbers that way. We have to start thinking about how we solve the problem over the long haul. And, but why do you think that it took so long for someone to come in? Because it has been being done this way for years, right? Why did it take so long for a pair of fresh eyes to say, huh, this isn't going to work? Well, I think the governor alluded to it today in his speech when he talked about, you know, when we had a period of time when revenue was growing by 10% a year for three and four years in a row, you know, people weren't paying that much attention to the fact that we had escalating costs built into the law. But now that we're into the third and fourth year of very difficult budgets where the economy has been at the low point of a cycle, it's become, you know, it became quickly apparent to him that this was just unsustainable practices. Okay, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the tone that the governor used today. I, I know that you've been talking to him a lot, and he, he seemed at once to be very frustrated and almost even angry with the legislature and, and the special interest, and we know he's been talking about the special interest for a while now, but he spoke about almost a drug addiction uh, to spending, to stimulus spending that had been injected into the body, if you will, and now is all gone. But then at the end, he extended a hand to them. So that's kind of a mixed message, isn't it? Well, Liz, I don't think he was angry as much as uh, he showed candor and integrity. Uh, what the governor said publicly to the legislature today during his briefing, he has said privately in a mansion, privately at a number of meetings with members on, on both sides, with, with both houses, going through the challenges that this state has faced. So I think his message was direct. It was to the point. And going back to the question you asked Bob Magna, I think that the governor deserves A, for courage and integrity, for putting a light on his dark room with the budget. How can you build in 12, 13 plus percent accelerators every year to a budget. Uh, it is so far beyond uh, the realm of understanding how this is done. If you are running a city, a county, a town, or a village, or any organization, that is not done. And the issue is not with Bob Magna and the Budget Bureau, because the budget directors, and, and I love my budget director when I was in Rochester, their job is to give you the numbers and the mm -hmm. facts. It is up to the executive and the legislature to make these decisions. I think what the governor has done has put that light on the process, and he has done something that I've not seen before. He has educated taxpayers in this state. Uh, he has created a situation where he's, he's not just talking about or talking with a tone of anger. He's talking with a tone of candor, and he is educating people across the state. Here is why we're in this mess. Okay. Uh, either of you, I mean, speaking about the cuts, we're talking about some serious cuts, $3 billion for Medicaid. Uh, we've heard from some folks like Haney, Stan Sisto from 1199, the healthcare workers and Greater New York Hospital Association. They say, and now all of these people, mind you, are on the Medicaid Redesign Task Force tasked with coming up with how these cuts are actually going to be made, but they say that it's impossible to get that far. I mean, wh what is going to have to be to get that deep into Medicaid? Well, I think 
the governor has put the task force together and has Jim Introne and Jason Helgerstein, and I think both of them have said that in talking to task force members, while they know that this would be a difficult number to achieve, they're more optimistic, I think, that it's possible as they talk to the individual members of the task force. Mm. And they believe that as the task force works on the problem and we move, they, they figure out solutions to moving high cost individuals into better care and low cost options, that they think that this actually is an achievable target. Well, Liz, if I could add one thing. Uh, sure. What, what, what others say they can't do, we have a governor who cut his own state operations by 10%, an enormous cut, five times what cities and localities are cutting. So he has stepped up and made his own cuts. And I think here is where the, the, the point we have to get to with the budget. These budgets have been built on these double digit increase projections for years. And so in essence, uh, it's like having your MasterCard maxed out. Uh, and, and just saying, well, you, you cannot end up uh, meeting those expectations anymore. You can't spend more. The, the whole thing is not to spend more. It's to start curtailing your habits and start thinking and acting differently as a state oh. so we get the state back. Okay, so I'm just, just to be clear, though, if, in fact, the Medicaid task force comes back and says to you guys, we couldn't get to $3 billion, we could get to, well, it's actually 2.85, but we could only get to 2.1 or we could only get to wherever they could get, then what happens? Well, the governor has, we included language in the appropriation bill that we put forward that gives the governor the ability if the task force comes back and, and doesn't quite achieve the target, although we're very optimistic they will, that gives him the authority working with the health commissioner and with other folks in his administration to find these cuts, but which again, as the lieutenant governor has mentioned just now, shows his seriousness about the, you know, the fiscal problem that we're facing. But regardless, I'm sorry, just, just so w does the legislature need to sign off on that power for the health commissioner to have the ability to make up the difference when the task force can't come in? Well, if they pass the governor's budget with that language in it, right. that, that would be that's what the governor would have the authority to do. Right. Liz, just one addition to what Bob said. So many of these reductions are, are really can be looked at in terms of administrative costs and overhead. And the governor walked through that process today in terms of where the spending was per dollar in Medicaid. Uh, we can't just can't come back and say we can't do it. I think we have to find ways to do it. I always go back to the example of a family. If a mom or dad loses a job, they don't have accelerators. They don't have maintenance of effort legislation. A mom or dad has to make a decision in their family about spending less, and that's what the governor is asking everyone to do in this case, is, is to make those decisions so we can get the state back in order. When you are relying in many cases on, on, on task, force, is, task forces or even negotiations. I mean, this budget has a, not holes per se, but you're relying on things like contract negotiations for, with the state employees unions. If they don't give concessions, there will be 9,800 layoffs, for example. Well, the, the prison closure uh, task force, there is also a question as to who, what, when, where. I mean, there's a lot of uh, um, not things that aren't clear. Well, in terms of the layoffs, I, one of the questions that is going to come up, how many will there be or how many can be rejected? First of all, with the cuts, there's an opportunity through attrition, through negotiations to save jobs. The governor does not want to have people losing jobs and being out of work. The governor has to meet uh, these tremendous budget obligations. So if labor leaders and legislative leaders and the governor are able to come to the table as the governor has really put forth and opened up his arms too, we can reach these without having families uh, being more seriously impacted. These are decisions that should be made, and this is how we get ourselves out of a crisis, not throwing up our hands and digging in, but finding a way out together, everybody coming to the middle of the table and finding a path forward. So, but this is a, an unusual strategy, is it not? Um, Mr. Magna, I've never seen um, a budget that's put together, whereas so much is placed on the possibility of these ad hoc negotiations and, and task force recommendations coming well, in? Well, first of all, it's, I don't think it's an unusual strategy. I think it's a focused strategy, and I don't think it's that ad hoc. I, I think I'd object to that a little bit. I think the task force, for example, is a very focused method. It was used in another state, successfully mm. Wisconsin, and the governor has showed a willingness to look at what works and then to put that in place. The prison closure piece, I think, is a very intelligent 
way to approach reducing capacity. Rather than just talking about, oh, I'm going to close this prison, this prison, and that prison, you put the people who know most about the economic impacts and know most about the impacts on the prison system, and you put them together to get a set of recommendations within a time frame that allows you to get the savings that we're budgeting, including legislative representation. So the legislature is represented on the health committee. They're represented on the prison committee. So these are people that would be involved in the negotiations in any case. And as the lieutenant governor said, the governor's bringing them to the middle of the table to help frame decisions in an intelligent, rational way. Do we believe that there will actually be, since March 1st, for the Medicaid task force and also mandate relief task force to report back, that these will be included in the 30-day budget amendments, or is that too soon? I think it's too soon to say if we're going to make you know, these kinds of changes in the 30-day amendments. I think that's a possibility, but again, the governor has made it clear that all of these task force recommendations will be available in time to achieve the full savings that he's been talking about or that he's put into the, into the budget that we're discussing today. Liz, okay. I think it does create a sense of urgency with the task forces because of, of the enormous cuts and the challenges that we have to really get to the table and work on this and, and hopefully bring all sides together. And just one last point on the prisons. What the governor has done, which I think is brilliant, is not only is he putting out uh, a, uh, a question and a challenge to the legislature in each region about the potential closures or consolidations, he's not naming a prison, he's not saying this one facility will be closed, but he's putting out to see what are the best decisions. If that decision is made and he's not named that, what he's also done is incorporate in his budget a substantial amount of money to, to put into any community that may be impacted by a prison closure. Right. Prisons like military bases are often big economic drivers in communities. The governor understands that. So in the event this happens, he's already building in a mechanism that will help soften that blow and perhaps create a more sustainable economy in that community going forward. Well, I want to thank you very much for talking with me a little bit more about the budget. I'm sure we'll be uh, talking again. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy, thank you. And State Budget thanks, Director Liz. Bob Magna, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much.